Welcome to our third SOL review video. There's going to be one more. Um, so I don't want to waste too much time. Hopefully you've gone through and done the questions on the PDF for this one. If not, then maybe pause it and uh, work them yourself before you view the answer. Okay, so let's get started. All right, this is click on the statement you want to select. And when it says the statement up here, um, I think that we get to think that there's one answer here, the statement, okay? Um, it would say each statement if it was more than one. Michelle correctly solved the linear equation, and the last line of her work was 1 equals 2. Which statement best describes the solution to the equation Michelle was solving? Well, first of all, we know, we are quite aware, that 1 does not equal 2. That that is impossible, the two values are not equal. And this is what we call a false statement. And we get this in lots of different little places that we, um, we can see this in algebra in different places. We can see it in um, systems of equations. We can see it in single variable equations. Um, it indicates that there is no solution in that particular situation. So a false statement indicates no solution at all. And that's pretty easy to equate, to put together. And it comes from something like having an equation where you have 1 half times 30x minus 45 is equal to 1 third of uh, 45x minus, let's say, uh, 3. Well, I can distribute, and I got 15x minus half of 45 would be 22.5. And over here, I got 1 third of 45x would be, um, again, 15. Not sure why I tried to write the 1 third again. 15x, <clears throat> one third of three would be one. Well, at that point, I would subtract 15x from each side and I would get something that is clearly false because negative 22.5 does not equal negative one. That's impossible. So we had an equation that may not have looked it to begin with, but it turned out to have no solution. And that's what this indicates. And that's what I'm supposed to recognize there. The other possibilities here, of course, the only solution being one or two, you would see x equals one x equals 2. This would be for a quadratic situation where you have an x squared in your equation. Um, and this would be if I got a statement like 1 equals 1 or 2 equals 2, um, a statement that is true in value. Okay, um, And that would indicate infinitely many solutions. So in the end for this one, the one you would pick would be that one. Okay, click on all the numbers you want to select. Only select the correct numbers. Again, if they say click on all the numbers, so we get to um, assume that there should probably be more than one answer here. <clears throat> I can't guarantee you that it's going to be more than one, but it, it, it's telling you here that it's probably more than one, but probably not all. Okay, let's read it. A set of data for the number of points a basketball team earned for each of nine games in a tournament is shown. The mean for the data set is approximately 80.1. And the standard deviation is approximately 6.1. Using these approximations, which scores are within one standard deviation of the mean? Well, when we say within one, that means one standard deviation above the mean and one standard deviation below the mean. And these values um, are going to be found by actually taking the numbers and adding them to find the above value, 86.2 and subtracting them to find the below value, which would be 74. And so that's our above and below value. So what we're looking for is we're looking for numbers that are bigger than 74 and smaller than 86.2. So which ones would that be? Well, bigger than 74 would be 75, 78, 80, but still smaller than 86.2. We go all the way out to that 85. So we'd select those five numbers in the center. So again, within one, one above, one below, within one. Okay, so we have here a table of values, x's and y's. And it says which statement is true. And so this um, question as I read through these, oh, it's about direct and inverse variation. Well, hopefully I know a couple of things about each. Hopefully I know that a direct variation is one where it's y equals k times x. And if I can solve that for k, it would be y over x. 
So it's the ratio of y over x that stays constant in a direct variation. And I should know about an inverse variation that it's y equals k over x. And that if I solve for k, it's x times y. It's the product of x and y that stays constant. So that's those are the details I'm supposed to know about a direct variation. But what would we, what we would hopefully recognize here is that this data in this table up here does not fit either well it's the same equation but it does not fit that equation. And you could figure that out by using the table on your calculator or you could plug and chug the numbers. You can see pretty clearly -2.5 times 1 may um plus 12.5 may be 10, but if you go ahead and plug in the 4 you definitely do not get um, 2.5 for y. Then I can look down here at these two, and before long I'll be able to see that this is definitely the equation that matches for this set of data, but what I have to make sure I recognize is whether that's a direct or an inverse variation. Well, hopefully this is something I remembered here. Okay, and the other thing that you could use is um, as the x is increasing, the y is decreasing there. And that, by definition, is an inverse variation. So we're going to go with D on this one. In which table do the values represent the rules shown? The square of the sum of x and 5 is equal to y. Well, one of the things I like to do with expressions um, when I'm translating expressions like this is I like to annotate. And whoops. Hold on. Can I get rid of that still? Yeah. Eraser, eraser. Sorry about that. I like to annotate. The square of the sum of x and 5, the square of, is going to be an exponent of 2 right there, is equal to y. Okay, so the square of the sum of x and 5. So that's going to be x plus 5, the quantity squared, and that's equal to y. That's the equation we're looking for here. And I could very well take that and put it into the um, calculator and look at the table, or I can just start plugging in numbers. 3 plus 5 squared, 3 plus 5 is 8, squared would be 64. Well, no, nope, nope, there it is. C is the correct answer. Let's double check by checking the 4. 4 plus 5, the quantity squared, yep, that's 81. Yep, definitely got it. What is the value of this expression when a equals 8, b equals 16, and c equals negative 4? So this is a plug and chug question. And the great thing, the wonderful thing, is the state of Virginia says that you're allowed to use that handy dandy TI 83 or 84 calculator. Now all I'm doing is plugging in the numbers here. Notice I'm going to put a, a set of parentheses around that negative 4. That's probably smart there. And square root of 16 plus 9. Now if I type that exactly as you see it into my calculator, um, it's going to go ahead and find me the correct answer. So this is 5 times 2 plus, so the negative 4 times square root of 16 is 4, so plus um, 16, because it's going to be minus, and then negative 4 times 4, and then plus 9. So 10 plus 26, or 10 plus 16 is 26, plus 9 is 35. Whew. Um, but again, the graphing calculator does that for you if you want it to. Um, of course I want you to be able to do it on paper or digital paper, if you will, the way that I'm writing there. Sorry, I had to fix my mistake. It was ugly. Uh, but the calculator can do that um, to double check it for you as well. And the correct answer there is B. Which... Uh, an inequality is shown. Ta-da, inequality. Which inequality is true because of the division property of inequality? Now, before anyone says, we never learned about that, yeah, you did. Um, I could actually even give you the video link that goes with it. It's uh, the um, Solving Inequalities video, probably from the first marking period, actually. So what does the division property of inequality say? Well, it says that when you divide both sides of an inequality by a number, it's true, except that when you divide both sides of an inequality by a number and say the number c is less than zero that means that you have to flip the symbol around on your inequality you have to invert that symbol because this is a negative and that's actually what that property says and yes we did learn that so we want to show we want to find the one that shows multiplying both sides by negative two well this one's kind of obvious that they're trying to say they're, they're trying to trick you into not realizing you have to multiply both sides there. 
And then this one didn't flip, so it's got to be B. When factored completely, so click on the boxes to choose the factors you want to select. So look, plural, factors, boxes, so we know we have more than one here. Factor completely. Okay, so this is one of the things that I want you to take away from the factored completely. That means that the factors inside, like these would be sets of parentheses here, all six of these, they can't have GCFs inside. So I should recognize that these two are not eligible because they both have a GCF of three. And so we're not going to be able to use either one of those. But the best way to do this question would be to actually um, factor it. So we have 9x squared minus 39x minus 30 right up here. And I automatically can see everything is divisible by 3. So I'm going to divide out a 3. Now I need my AC and B. AC is negative 30. B is negative 13. We want factors of negative 30 that add up to negative 13. Well, I don't use negative 30. I'm going to look for factors of 30 that have a difference of 13. Oh, and there it is right there. When you subtract 15 minus 2, you get 13. Okay, but I want a negative 13 and a negative 30. So which one of these two has to be negative to give me the appropriate sum? The 15 does. So those are the two numbers I'm going to use to break apart my middle term. So I'm still going to have my 3. I'm going to have 3x squared minus 15x plus 2x minus 10. And the value of that is still the same. It's still a minus 13x when you simplify. Then I'm going to factor by grouping. Still the 3. I'm going to divide out a 3x from the first set, leaving me x minus 5. I'm going to divide a positive 2, leaving me x minus 5, which, and parentheses there for that 3 from out front, we have our 3, we have 3x plus 2, and we have x minus 5. Now, I did not do a lot of explaining there, but you guys, we've been doing this for a while. Most of you have gotten yourselves over this factoring difficulty. And while it may not be our strongest skill in the course, um, you should be able to do it a little better now than you did before, because we have worked on it for a while. All right, keep practicing the factoring. The mean for a data set is 45. The z-score for data point A is 0. Hmm. Well, what does it mean for a z-score to be 0? Well, let's think about data distribution. There we go. Dot, da, 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 da. Oh, no, it's a little off-center. Just pretend. Okay, so this is 1 standard deviation above the mean, 2 standard deviations above the mean, one below and two below. And that's as far as we're going to point that out at the moment. Remember, this corresponds to z-score. A z-score of one means one standard deviation above the mean. So what's a z-score of zero? It's the mean. The mean has a z-score of zero. So one of my numbers, a, because it says the, the z-score for a is zero, has to be 45. A has to be 45. It doesn't make sense for it to be 0 because that's way low. The z-score for data point B is 0 0.2. That puts us, 0 0.2, that puts us maybe like here, right? So a little bit bigger than the mean. So we want a, a, a value that's bigger than the mean. So we want C, not D, because 44.2 would be below the mean. So z-score is all about number of standard deviations above or below the mean that a particular value is in a data set. And yay, another z-score question. <laughs> they really seem to pile on the z-score questions in this um, set of practice um, problems here from the state. All right, statistical information for the data set is given. The mean of a data set is 30. Mean 30. The standard deviation is 3. The z-score for a data point is 2.25. So that means that that data point is two and a quarter standard deviations above the mean. In which interval is this data point? So we need to know what two and a quarter standard deviations actually is. So we need 2.25 times three. Well, don't, don't pick up your calculator mindlessly. Use your brain. 
2 times 3 is 6. 2 times 0.25, or 3, excuse me, times 0.25 is like 3 quarters. 0.75. So we want the value that we're talking about since it's a positive 2.25 is 36 36.75 eh, that's got to be the data point well which one is in that interval it's d now it's barely in that interval cuz it's just barely above 36 but that's the value we're we're actually talking about so that's the only interval that it's in and guys this concludes our video and i know they're getting longer um, but power through, uh, it's all going to be worth it in the end. I'll see you guys in class.